My name's Otis Johnson. I'm from Coralitas. I have two horses. I compost and started composting the manure for those horses, which is how I got into composting originally. Uh, then I got into the master composter program where people were composting all kinds of things, kelp and uh, yard waste, newspaper, whatever they could get their hands on. And so um, originally I thought it was a really, really, really good composter because my composting process was so complete. Um, pile always heated, it always got to completion very quickly and I had no issues, but then I realized after playing with it for a while that horse manure is about the perfect thing to compost. Other than grass clipping, uh, grass clippings, I can think of nothing more perfect to compost. Um, so there are carbon to nitrogen ratios, which Ang Angie mentioned briefly. Horse manure generally is in a range of 25 to one to 30 to one carbon to nitrogen. And that's about exactly what you need to compost. The National Organic Program accepts anything from 40 to one to 25 to one as being ideal. If you've got horse manure, it's gonna get you there in almost all cases. Every horse is a little bit different. It depends on what you feed them. It depends on uh, other cultural conditions that are going on at your site, but for the most part, you're gonna be in that range with horse manure. Uh, so it's very easy to compost. The other nice thing about that is that horse manure coming out of the horse is also the perfect moisture content to begin composting. So you don't really always have to add to it as long as you collect it relatively early before the sun's had a chance to dry it out or before the rain's had a chance to completely saturate it, then the, it's it's perfect to compost. Uh, I have to add a lot of water to my compost because I compost outside on the ground and um, I'm assuming then I'm losing, I'm losing most of that from evaporation and, and through the process. But uh, anyhow, so that's part of my system. Keeping that moisture content there is what keeps you heating and keeps the process going. Um, so there are many different um, systems that will indicate whether or not the compost is going the way it should. And different people use diff different temperature ranges. I default to the National Organic Program there again, and 131 degrees is the minimum temperature that you need to be organic, to have your material be suitable for use in organic production. Uh, and so since I also use horse manure compost in my vegetable garden, uh, I want it to be suitable for use in organic production because I don't want to eat anything that potentially could kill me. Whenever you start to lose heat is your first sign that there is a problem going on. Uh, and so then you need to adjust something. Either your pile size is not sufficiently large or you don't have enough nitrogen in the process. So then you need to amend it or moisture is also another of those big problems that you can have. So if, you, if it's pile size, the pile has to be at least three feet by three feet by three feet to have enough insulation in the pile to allow the material inside to heat. Um, so once you get beyond that three foot by three foot with horse manure, you're going to be heated. But with other materials, you may or may not, depending on how much airflow there is. So with stuff like chicken manure, which is liquid as far as I know for the most part, you would need uh, a fairly decent bulking agent to allow airflow through a relatively liquid manure. Uh, so wood chips would be a good choice, I think, for that. And I'd probably use something like a pine chip or redwood chips if, if they're available to you. Um, so um, beyond that is just the amount of time it has to be hot to thoroughly kill weed seeds, pathogens, uh, and in the case of horses, um, what do you call them? Intestinal worms. Uh, and, and that's a, a major, so as part of integrated pest management, you would just want to stop the life cycle of those intestinal parasites. The way you do that is just to keep the horses from grazing directly in the manure, where it's, which is where the worms are living. So if you collect it every day and remove it from the site, then there's not going to be much of a possibility or a, a much lessened possibility that the horses are going to re-ingest the, uh, the larvae of are they strong giles, strong giles, worms that, that get in there. So 131 days, National Organic Program calls for at, at least three days of that. So that is also predicated though on what kind of system you're using. If you're using an in-vessel system like the system that Tom has, which every person should strive for in their lives, uh, then you know three days is sufficient. If you're using a windrow system like the one that I use, it has to be that hot for 14 days. Uh, and my windrows are gonna stay hotter than 131 degrees for 14 days in all cases, but because of the way I do it, one side of the windrow is always hotter than the other side. And later on today, after we talk about Tom's system, we're gonna go up to the top over there. And I built a little tiny windrow and we can play with that and I can just show you basically how that system works. So beyond um, getting the manure processed, 
you, you would consider why you want the manure to be composted. Why wouldn't you just leave it on the ground, let it compost naturally, and become a wonderful soil amendment by the horses trampling on it and playing in it regularly? Uh, <laughs> well, um, by itself and before it's gone through that process of heating, getting to 131 degrees for at least three days, it is the perfect place for terrible things to live. Anaerobic bacteria, um, pathogens. Uh, so if you left it on the ground and you did nothing else, it would be a, a, a breeding ground. It would be the equivalent of eating your breakfast in the bathroom. Flies are another big problem in horse facilities, at horse facilities. Uh, flies and manure, great place for flies to breed. So you eliminate that by keeping your piles covered, keeping the flies from having access to the manure, and also by heating it, uh, it becomes less, much less attractive to flies. You reduce your flies, in most cases, to nearly uh, minimal. It, it, the problem goes away. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then water quality is another major, major. I live on the top of a ridge in Coralitas. Um, and even though I'm a fair, a fair distance from Coralitas Creek, um, you, can, you can follow the pattern of where my pile would sit, sit and flow down the hill into the drainage channels into Coralitas Creek and eventually out to the ocean. Um, people in Nebraska probably don't have as, as big a problem as we do here close to the ocean, but you don't want the nitrates that are in manure, fresh manure, to get into water systems. It causes algal blooms and creates a host of other problems. Uh, so all that nitrate leaching that goes on, you prevent by properly composting your manure. So the process that's actually going on when you're beginning to compost the manure is that individual microbes, bacteria, and uh, fungi are eating the, uh, the raw materials that you have. We call them feedstocks. And as they process those feedstocks, they're converting the nitrogen in nitrate form to begin with, liquid form, into ammonium. And then that ammonium is immobilized. So it's much less likely to leach into the groundwater. Um, so that's, once you get beyond that three days, it's fairly immobilized and you're not going to have much of a problem with it leaching into the groundwater and creating problems. The other major issue that can happen when you build big piles, and a lot of people are fond of just having big 20-foot piles of manure sitting around, is that the inside of that pile is, doesn't get proper airflow. Because it doesn't get proper airflow, um, it goes anaerobic in the center. When it goes anaerobic, then you start to lose some of the valuable nutrients that you have in there. And usually, you can smell that as soon as it begins to happen. Uh, if you smell ammonia, you're losing nitrogen in your system. Um, almost immediately, you walk up, you smell that smell, you know I'm losing nitrogen. Um, so don't do it. The main elements required for any composting process, horse manure or otherwise, is that carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you need your browns and your greens, 25 to 1, 30 to 1 in that general range. But you also need air and you need water. Uh, and so probably the most commonly overlooked element is air. Uh, and air really accelerates microbes. It gets them going and keeps them going. If you are having a problem with your pile heating and you've got sufficient moisture, you probably have an issue with airflow. Um, and that is why I compost in a windrow, because I can't really create a system that forces the air through it on a regular basis and keep that going. Um, then I just build a windrow that allows passive airflow. Um, although I compost for myself at home in my relatively small windrow system, I once thought it would be a good idea to take on a more challenging project, and so I joined up with some people who had roughly 60 to 80 horses, depending on what was going on at their boarding facility, uh, and we started compost their, composting their manure. Um, so we learned a few important things during that process. Um, some of their manure in the lower end of their facility was just raw manure. The people who had stalls outside and it was uncovered, they didn't have a lot of bedding. It worked very well. And you know that manure just composted rapid fire in huge windrows that they turned with a tractor. Um, other than that, though, the folks on the upper end of the scale had tons and tons and tons and tons of bedding. Uh, you know, there was one stall I remember walking into, and you could just plop on the floor and lie there. And, and you know, it's ultimate luxury. But I don't think the horse really cared. Uh, but the owner, you know, I don't know. I won't even go into that. But some people care, some people don't. I don't care that much <laughs> about that. Um, but they, they were using shavings. And so those shavings 
in those stalls created lots of problems. One of them is that they really threw off the carbon to nitrogen ratio. We suddenly had a huge amount of carbon and we didn't really have enough nitrogen to offset that. Um, so eventually we began adding from Starbucks and some local restaurants coffee grounds to that mix so that we got back to that ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio and also we allowed the shavings which are relatively flat and they compress very easily like grass clippings uh, don't allow airflow through the pile so we went to a pine pelleted bedding that worked very well uh, and so the pine pelleted bedding is dried uh, it also absorbs a lot of moisture i love it for collecting urine. Urine's a great source of nitrogen. Um, urine also begins to smell pretty rapidly if you leave it out there. And so if you, the horses, in my estimation, regularly go in the same spots. Does anybody agree or disagree with that concept? <laughs> they go in the same spot. So, and it, and it works very well for me, so I can go to that spot. I can put my pine pelleted bedding there. They go, they do their business there. I go by and go, wow, look at all that great nitrogen just for me. I scoop it up, I put it into my pile, and it doesn't change anything. My consistency stays exactly the same. Everything keeps moving without any problem. So, eventually, at the same facility, they switched from shavings to rice hulls. And I thought I was going to have a similar problem with rice hulls. Um, but we then started composting off-site. I met an organic farmer who said, it would be really nice if you could deliver, say, tons of manure to my site. What do you think? I can do that. Uh, <laughs> so we delivered, um, you know, truckloads upon truckloads of material there. Um, and initially, the fields where they put it were too wet to turn and I was really worried and I thought we were going to have a problem because the piles also weren't covered. But because of the, the consistency of the rice hulls, they acted as a very nice bulking agent and allowed airflow to continue. Those piles stayed 140 degrees for weeks, uh, many, many weeks, and it composted fully. We had no problem and in the end, the consistency was very, very good. Uh, in fact, I eventually started using it as footing in the, uh, in the round pan at my house because it just had so, you know, the, the quality of it was so good. Uh, and so anyway, you mix that with sand 50-50 and you can use it. Uh, and so one of my other uh, hobbies is figuring out ways to use horse manure compost because the people who have a lot of it have way too much of it and they need ways to get rid of it. Uh, and so I use it as kitty litter uh, and the cats absolutely love it. I discovered that originally because I'd put it in various places around, the cats would almost always find it and do their business in it. And so I thought, well, why should I continue buying cat litter? I can use this stuff. So now I just take a little bit of that pine pelleted bedding and put it in the bottom of the little, of the horse, of the cat's, uh, what do you call it? Litter box, litter box that's it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And then, uh, so anyway, and then put compost on top of that. And you clean it out a couple, three times a week. After about a month or so, it gets to be beyond that point. And then you take it and put it on ornamentals only. Uh, you, you would never want to mix uh, the feces of animals that are meat eaters, um, vegetarians, no problem. And that's just manure for compost. Um, so that's just a little anecdotal thought. Um, if you're having any problems composting, then maybe you should try something like a bulking agent. Uh, wood chips are usually the most readily available bulking agent that's out there to use to compost manure. Um, so uh, we talked about pile height and then systems that you, um, that you create are individual. Um, every place I've ever been, they did their composting just a little bit different. I do my composting just a little bit different, and it's constantly evolving. Uh, so my composting system now is what I call a walking windrow, uh, and essentially I build a pile that's roughly six feet wide, and I've never actually measured one of my piles and, and thought, you know, it's, it's six and a half feet now. It, it's, uh, it's, I, I play it by ear, when it stops heating, I realize I have a problem, I adjust according to that. But generally speaking, the pile is, is roughly six feet wide, um, about four feet tall. Uh, and depending on how you're collecting and, and moving your manure around, um, and I don't know if this is an issue for everybody, but um, it's hard to keep a pile height of about four feet, which is right in here. Uh, if you take a wheelbarrow and you just drop it on the ground, your pile is only gonna be a couple feet tall. So if you don't wanna spend a lot of time building that up, uh, most often, and I only have two horses, I collect in a bucket and then I can take that bucket and put it on top directly of the material so I can keep my pile heights up. And then a little while later, I'll show you just spreading that pile out and getting it to be where, where I want it and need it to be. 
There are a variety of other systems that you can use to compost horse manure. And once you know what those basic principles are, you can just go out and create whatever system works best for you. It's nice to site your compost pile in an area where it's not going to sit in moisture constantly, uh, where it has relatively good drainage. And if you're going to access it with equipment, tractors, which I wish I had, but I don't, uh, that kind of thing, you want to be able to have a pad that's firm enough to allow you to do that. You also want a, a pad where possible that's not going to allow uh, nitrate leaching or any kind of leaching in your pile. There are salts in horse manure that should be leached, but in most cases, if you're using it in an outdoor situation, you're going to get that leaching naturally, just as you water uh, or as it rains. Um, so, and most of that, so, most of those salts come from the horse's urine. Um, anyhow. Um, where was it? Very systems. So beyond building a windrow or having an aerated system, you can just create one big pile uh, and then cover that pile with a carbon source and let the thing sit for six months. It will compost very well by itself. You'll get anaerobic periods, you'll get anaerobic pockets, but for the most part you're going to you're going to get a finished product that is composted. If you have the space to do that, it works well. Uh, and from there, I learned that one of the best compost caps is compost. Uh, it is a high carbon source. Once it's done, it can go directly over the top of your manure. It acts as a very good insulator. Uh, and so yeah, I use compost to cap all my piles. Uh, and so capping for me, though, is different than covering. And that cap is... I don't is, know what you mean by that. What okay. Uh, by capping, I'm putting that material directly into the pile. It's finished compost, and that first four inches of material is finished compost. So as ammonia in the pile, for instance, volatilizes and, and begins to leave the pile, that carbon cap captures that material and keeps it in my pile. My objective in composting is to get as much nitrogen as I can uh, in the system, because that's what's going to be deficient in things that I'm trying to grow. Which only will work, of course, when, once you have some finished compost. But once you have that finished compost, then you can cap it with uh, with carbon and in this case compost is is the best carbon readily available you have it right there it's part of your system you can water directly on top of the cap um, most often the materials being watered as I'm adding it to the pile to get a pile watered again and last night it rained you know so I go oh it's raining it's great I'm gonna go outside open up all my piles I'm gonna get all this free water uh, you know this morning I had maybe an inch of saturation into the pile very very difficult to get water to transfer from the top of that pile to the bottom of the pile. It's much easier actually to get the center of the pile moist and then allow the moisture to come through it. And in a windrow, the dynamics work that way so that the, the moisture is migrating up and out of the pile. So most often, if I'm going to water it, I will open up the pile, water the center of it, and then cover it again and allow it to get evenly moist. Uh, so beyond the capping, though, is tarping. And tarping for me is essential because it's the only way I can really control moisture. Um, and so to control the moisture in the pile, and water is a big issue for me. Um, I share the well with four other people where I live, and they get really antsy when they see me out, like, you know, spending time watering my compost piles. A tarp keeps the moisture in the pile in the summer. And in the winter, when it gets really, really wet and piles tend to get saturated, of course, when they get saturated, there is no airflow. It goes anaerobic almost immediately when it's completely saturated, and <coughs> it, it creates lots of problems. That's when your neighbors call you and say, something really smells bad over there. Can you fix it? Um, which I've never had happen yet. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, <laughs> the moisture regulation is easiest for me with a tarp. If I had a nice covered building, it would be even easier. But then when it rained, I wouldn't be able to just necessarily take advantage of pulling the tarp back and letting, letting the pile get rained in. Um, so that's basic pile dynamics. Almost always tarp, some rules, always tarp, always cap with carbon. And that's why I use my walking windrow system, because I know all the material at some point, including that outside cap, goes back into the heat source. Eventually all of it, if you've got a windrow and it's here and it's moving like this, then my cap eventually comes back and becomes the center of the pile. The center of the pile heats and it just keeps going. And you go out to measure the temperature in your pile in the morning and maybe you're not completely awake. You put the compost thermometer, which has got, you know, minus 18 inches, goes to the center of the pile and gives me an idea of how hot it is. So once I've confirmed I'm at least at 131 degrees and I feel good about that, then I go along to other places in the pile and I see 
just how the process is proceeding. Once it gets to the point where it's no longer heating, then I may be completely composted out or I may need to add something to it to completely get it to compost. Uh, the thing you should be mindful of after you get your 18 inch compost thermometer is that if you're going to work the pile, that when you insert your, your probe to see how hot it is, remove the probe and put it aside. Because if you work the pile and you leave the probe in there, you won't be able to find it. Horse manure, there are, the horse's digestion is incomplete. It doesn't, com it doesn't completely get rid of all the feedstocks that they've taken in. And so it's, all, it's rich in bacteria as it leaves the horse and there's additional food left over. So it's a very, very good hot manure to use to get other piles started and to keep your process moving if you ever have problems stopping it, with it stopping if you're composting other things. Uh, so now my primary composting item is vegetable waste, but occasionally my process gets a little stilted, it doesn't work as well, I can go and grab some horse manure, add it to that process, it gets everything going again, and I keep moving on. So I know at the beginning of my windrow, if it starts to slow down rapidly, it goes from 140 to 80, that there's probably a problem in the winter, that the, the most common cause of that is saturated pile, it's too wet, uh, and there's no air circulating through the pile anymore. Of course, there's an inverse relationship between air and water. The more air space there is, you know, those, those spaces are either filled with air or water. If you fill them too much with water, you won't have any air circulation. If you fill them too much with air, you don't have enough moisture to keep the process going. Uh, and then the second way that I know is foul odors. When foul odors start to be released from the pile, I know that there's something going wrong in my process and that I'm probably losing some fairly valuable nutrients. Um, composting is a good smelling process. Uh, the end result should, should smell good when you go up there later on up at the top there at Tom's. I was over there playing with some of his manure earlier this morning and immediately you can smell they're called actinomycetes. They're bacteria that live in the pile. They're white in color, kind of a grayish white ashen color. Um, they are what give soil its characteristic smell. And so when you're doing this process, it should smell like that often. If it starts to smell like something other than that, sulfur, ammonia, uh, then you're losing nutrients from your pile. So normally if I'm talking about compost and just organic um, production, so you have a choice. You could use some of the rich brown stuff that's cruising around or you can go up and look at Tom's up here. Rich, it's kind of a reddish color for me when it finished compost or that which is Vigoro and that's what Vigoro looks like. That's soluble nitrogen fertilizer right there. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't think I'd want to eat it. With compost, you get a great soil amendment. It's going to hold more moisture. It's going to, water's going to infiltrate into it a whole lot better when you're applying it to the ground. Uh, but you aren't going to get a whole lot of soluble immediate nutrients. Uh, so a lot of people want that immediate burst and the, the conventional guys use those immediate bursts. That needs nitrogen. They give it nitrogen. It's immediate. It's soluble. It goes in. The plant takes it up. It gets, you get a response relatively fast. All this other stuff, the nitrogen in ammonium form that's locked up in compost is, is very, very slow release and it just kind of uh, meters itself out there. So if you have an immediate problem, then you need an organic fertilizer that you can apply immediately. The only one that I'm aware of that works extremely well is worm castings. And it just so happens that horse manure is the perfect environment for worms also. Uh, so in addition to my ordinary thermophilic piles, I have worm bins. The downside of, of using just worms is that the weed seeds don't get killed in just a worm bin. But if you have both systems operating together, you can thermophilically compost it first, kill the weed seeds. Pathogen's not as big of an issue because the worms will also take care of that. But once it's taken from your hot pile, you can add it to your worm bins, add more moisture because uh, thermophilic composting is about 50% the, uh, the moisture content that keeps the process going and you know you can take a bunch of it and put it in your hand and squeeze it and you should be able to get a drop coming from it. It should also hold together pretty well and not fall apart to give you an idea of what moisture you're talking about or you can take a probe and insert it into the mix and it'll tell you if it's between 40 and 60% to keep things moving along. Worms like it more like 80% and they like the temperature a little bit warmer. Uh, so it's nice to have some residual thermophilic compost that's going to give you a little bit of heat, get, add some more moisture to that, and get worm bins going. I have a landscaping business and I use only worm castings as my soluble fertilizer. I occasionally use some sustain. 
Uh, but for the most part, I use worm castings, and it works very well as a fertilizer. Uh, if I see a nitrogen deficiency, I walk over, the plants just yellowed out, and just, you know, I can add worm castings, water them in, or scratch them to the surface, water them in, uh, and I get almost immediate results. Mm -hmm. Worms don't really like to live in very deep situations. You know, they're usually going to be in the top three or four inches of material that you create. So it doesn't really make sense to have five foot deep worm beds, uh, your worm beds can be very, very shallow and the worms will thrive there. And so worms, Isenia petita, um, commonly called manure worms, are perfectly at home in horse manure compost. Uh, so the other thing you get, and my system is now catch and release, depending on what's going on in my world, I will, in the winter, when my piles are much wetter than they are in the summer, I'll get a lot more worms in my traditional uh, windrows. And they, so in, if I'm looking at a windrow, I get a circle around it that doesn't heat, uh, and then just the center of that pile heats. So around that outside edge and out to the sides, worms live there. Uh, and they, and they get very, very thick. Middle of winter, January, uh, moving forward, I will start to have lots and lots and lots of worms. So then I take them from there and just harvest them, put them into my worm beds, and then allow them to live there because that's the best place for them. And then when things start to dry out and I'm, I'm noticing that I'm not going to be able to maintain that, then I also remove them from the, the outdoor piles and put them in covered piles. Uh, and I also use a windrow to, to do my uh, worm composting. Uh, and that's just bricks. Uh, and then on top of the bricks, there's a pile and a tarp over the top of that that just keeps the moisture in that. I make sure that I keep it wet all the time. The worms live there. They don't leave the pile because it's the ideal environment for them to stay in the pile. Um, and I make lots and lots and lots of worm castings. Compost, after it goes through that heat break process and it's been at 131 degrees for at least three days, you could technically use it. At that point, it's still relatively high in nitrate nitrogen. Nitrate nitrogen is favored by certain kinds of plants. In this case, it would be annuals, vegetables, and grasses. So you could put it in your vegetable garden. If I were going to do that, I would do it in the, in the fall when I'm not really putting in a lot of things and I would let that material continue to age on the ground until I'm really going to plant in the spring. Um, but you're giving the vegetables the kind of nitrogen that they want, nitrate, uh, and the same stuff that would be leaching from your pile. Um, so once you get beyond that, you, you, you have more ammonium in the process. So most other things, perennials, trees, shrubs, like their nitrogen in the form of ammonium. Uh, and so in that case, more finished compost is what they're going to want. Um, I like to let compost, since I know I'm going to be using compost probably for the rest of my life, I like to let compost age for a year. Um, if you've got the space to do that, you're, you're going to have much fewer problems. In the early stage of the, of the process, the, we talked about the pile heating and thermophilic bacteria and mesophilic bacteria and all those guys. Um, the, at the beginning of the process, they are the most active. They are the guys who create the heat and break things down and make it a nice, safe product. But in the end, for it to be fully cured and it to be as active as it can be, the fungi, which are also a major part of the process, come in and do their work. Fungi spread by sending out hyphae <coughs> that go throughout the pile. They need a pile that really isn't being turned on a regular basis and being disturbed. They need to be able to spread out their hyphae. Uh, and so a curing pile allows that process to happen. And it allows things like lignin and other woody, woody parts of the compost to break down completely. Uh, and so more aged compost is, is appropriate for that. The other thing about compost is ick factor. Uh, some people don't like to get anywhere near horse manure or even the thought of horse manure or any kind of manure for that reason. Uh, so if you're going to be using it and people are putting it into a commercial potting mix, a commercial potting mix has to be really, really consistent. It's got to feel good in your hands. It's got to smell good. So manure that's been done for 14 days is probably not going to have those characteristics. But if it cures for a few months, it, it will be. I was just going to demonstrate kind of my whole walking windrow system and uh, reminded me one of the things I didn't talk about before is that when you're done, you usually get about 50% less volume than you started with, uh, which is also another major positive. So instead of having a big mountain, you have a little mountain. Um, but this is the beginning of a windrow, and a windrow is just a tubular row. My airflow is going to be going this way in this. Uh, and so I would normally try to make the sides a little like that, and then even off the top, 
like this. And to get my pile wider, I just work the fork down more to get the pile wider. And then once I'm there, at about here, and you know, and normally I'm gonna get a bit higher on this whole thing to start. So when I come out with my new material that I just collected that morning, I always take that new material and put it here at the beginning of the pile. Once I've collected all that material, then I just take my oldest material, which is over here, and I just scoop it over and cover. Uh, and so that's my carbon cap that we were talking about earlier. That also keeps moisture in the pile, so I don't have to come out here with water all the time. And I use a lot more water than he does. I, don't, I have to have water around to be able to do this. So originally, I started doing this in rows that just ran out. And they got about 20 feet long. And I thought that was great. But um, I went to some farm somewhere. And they hit me to the idea that you can just curve this pile around. So instead of my, once this pile is 20 feet long, taking my new material and putting it there, and then walking 20 feet to put it on there, the pile is just wrapping around back over here. So I can just kind of work right here and put the material right there. And it just keeps going this way until I'm done. Uh, and so that's the windrow concept. Windrow dynamics, and you're getting a little bit of a, a view of that. When I'm cutting into this pile, and then I cover it with a tarp, yeah, to keep uh, moisture out or moisture in, depending on what's going on. You get this wonderful cross section that also gives you an idea of how your process is moving along. And, you're, and I took this material earlier today and just stacked it over here. But you're seeing some of that now. So we talked earlier about actinomycetes, these grayish white guys right here. They are also real strong indicators to me that the process is moving along. So when I look at my piles in cross section, if I get huge anaerobic pockets or something else going on, I realize that I've got a little bit of a problem and I can adjust that as I move along. In this case, you can see this going here where the actinomycetes are definitely active and working and doing their things. And so you're in this pile is probably not big enough to, so that it's going to go anaerobic, but there are some areas getting more oxygen than others. And so here you can see where it's getting less oxygen right there. Uh, and so, you know, it's just a way of, of evaluating your process as you go along. So every day I get a little snapshot of what my pile is like just by cutting off the side, looking at it, and, and as it continues along. So eventually, though, this pile just can't continue forever because life ain't like that. Um, after three months, I take this whole pile, pile it into one big round pile, and then cover it and let it sit there and, and cure the rest of the way. So as your pile starts to snake around, mm -hmm. do you take the temperature in each of the sections or do you take it in one section and you know it's been that temperature for a certain amount of days and then you stop taking that one? Or oh yeah. The key area for me is I want to make sure I got that, th that 131 degrees for at least three days. So this is where I'm looking for that 131 degrees minimum right here. When I don't get it there, then I know I've got a problem. And then if I started inserting my probe, the further I go back, the cooler it gets till I get out to here usually. And here, I'm going to be at about ambient temperature. Most days when I just have the, the normal minimal amount of time, I just put the pile there and cover it. But the sides and the top never really get exposed to the heat. So then I, when I come out to the pile again, I would work it from here, push that stuff off to the sides, then take the material here, pull it forward, pull it to the front of the pile, Pull this side to the front of the pile, and then take this material, put my cap back on there, cap it on the front, and then I'm gone. <laughs>